Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns, uh, your host here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly online event where we cover commission activities and anything that may be of interest to Nebraska librarians. We do we have commission staff that do presentations and we bring guest speakers. Which, uh, today we have a sure session on every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. They are free and are recorded as we're recording this one. So if you um, want to listen to or view one in the you can. Today is our monthly Tech Talk with Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Library here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And Michael brings in guest speakers and does some talking about various tech in the last month or so. So mm -hmm. I'm going to actually hand it over to you to take right. over and do your thing. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Krista. Um, as mentioned, for uh, those of you who haven't met me before, I'm the uh, Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Commission, which basically means uh, if it has to do with technology, uh, I'm the one you generally call or I find out about things and, and whatnot. And um, gaming is one of the areas that Chris and I are into. We're, we're both gamers ourselves, but uh, in, mm -hmm. in slightly different ways. Yeah. You're more the online WoW sort of gamer and, I do video, do that. and video games. But I do have console games mm -hmm. as well. Yes, and well, and you know, I have an Atari 2600. Yeah, I don't have that. So, <laughs> so you know, if it's got more than one stick and a button, I get confused. <laughs> um, but I like my card games and my board games and, and things like that, oh, too. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. so I'm definitely a, a gamer there and, you know, have games on my phone, Bubble Burster or something like that. So anyways, um, what we've got today for you is we've got J.P. Picaro. I'm going to uh, attempt to unmute him. J.P., are you there? Yes. Hi, what's up, guys? Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch over and give you a presentation. J.P. is going to give us about a 20, 25-minute uh, little talk here, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So if you have questions as we're going along, just go ahead and submit them. Uh, into the Q&A area, and we'll read them back to JP. Or if you do have a microphone, as mm -hmm. we do here, you can just let us know in the question section, and we'll unmute you, and you can ask your question over your microphone. Yep. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to make JP a presenter. Yes. Okay, and he should be getting the magic screen. Awesome. Just a sec. All right. Let me there we go. Here. And and JP, I don't I, I, I don't know exactly the, the presentation you planned, but if you could start out by just kind of telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, eight bit library and uh, uh, where you're coming from with all this. Oh sure, okay. Uh, hi guys, I'm JP Percaro. I am a librarian at New Jersey City University, which is in Jersey City, uh, which is the home to the Statue of Liberty. I also run a website called 8bitlibrary.com. We're one of the highest trafficked library blogs on the web, and we generally talk a lot about gaming, and here we go, my internet's so slow. Oh boy. Well, I can show you that later. Anyway, I've been going on kind of a speaking thing, trying to get the, the word out. What, what me and, and Justin, who runs the website with me, what we're trying to do is get libraries to start building video game collections. Um, and you know, a lot of libraries, it, it, that's a, a very new thing, a very kind of new idea. Uh, a lot of libraries have been having games for a while, so, you know, it depends. But one issue that we always face before we can even start building a collection of video games to loan out or to use for programs is, is like, why should we have it in there? And so I've got this little, this little slide here, uh, uh, you know, some good reasons. Whoops. And of course, I can't click it. OK, step one, gaming is a storytelling media. This doesn't matter what type of game you're playing. It's telling some kind of story. Even, even a game like Tetris is, is telling a story in, in a certain way, whether it be through the images or the sounds, the mix of it. Um, the, and then there's games that have a, have a lot of character development or um, plot narrative devices all of the all of the words that we use to describe great books or great stories are words that you could describe video games with and you know along those lines gaming is a literate media which means that you you do need to know how to read to play it right there's a there's a lot of of um ideas that you need to understand you can't just pick it up and go um 
and along those lines, gaming is a media. And what I mean by that is a media is something that humans use to convey ideas, that we, we convey communication to other people, right? And video games is, is one of those ways that we do that. Books are one of those ways. Music, right? Um, you can think of all different types of media. Video game is one of those types of media. And a library, one of the roles, main roles that a library has always played in its community is the fact that it is a collection of media. So that's something that libraries do, and now this is a new form of media. And you know, once we've got that idea that, OK, a video game does maybe belong here, uh, we've got to think about, OK, so what can we use video games for? Just like what are we using our books for? One of those things is it builds community. You run a, a video game program, you're going to get some new faces out to your library. You're going to get people, um, you're going to get people playing with each other. You're going to get people who n wouldn't necessarily have ever had a conversation having a conversation, right? And that goes along with this next thing I have. It reaches out to a new audience or an existing audience in your library. And when I write here, everybody games, what I mean by that is that pick some way that we classify humans, race, gender, socioeconomic, age. It doesn't matter what you pick, everybody's gaming. So in the end, gaming is for all ages, and all libraries can be hopping on this, this boat. So let me go to the next one. So once we've gotten that down, um, where do you start? Well, that's the question that I get the most. Where do we start? I will make these slides public for you all later, so you can go back to click this link. But um, on my website, we have a sort of already outdated, well, it's not outdated. It's about it's a five hundred dollar startup, and my internet's not loading too well. But it's a five hundred dollar startup, which will start you if you can raise five hundred bucks to get all of the equipment you need and a couple of games that you you can start building that. Also, there's there's a lot of other great resources on the web right now that that can help you build the game. You you know where to start. But before you even get there, there's, there's some things that, that you have to apply to your collection that uh, doesn't matter what collection you're building. It doesn't matter if it's video games or books or whatever collection it is we're building. These are the, the places that you really need to start. And you know, starting small is, is a good way to, to begin because you know, <laughs> these, are, these are trying budgetary times. So let's start small. And knowing your audience, that's the, that's the key here. How can you find out what your audience needs? Um, you know, that's up to you. How are you already connecting with your library users? That's the thing you can think about on an institutional level. However, uh, you know, I have some suggestions. Someone, a friend of mine here in New Jersey, what he's done is he bought a few video games, right? And whenever someone would check one out, they would have a little slip. They would make them fill out a slip that said, what other video games would you want to check out? And then so then, then they've got an idea building of, of you know, what, what, what games do, do they not have yet that they need? And again, since this can apply to any form of collection you have in your library, you can do that with books too. You can do that with, any, in, with DVDs. You can do that with any uh, media that you have, that idea. So knowing your audience is important for a library, not just for gaming, um, and, and as well as having a plan. And what I mean by having a plan is uh, I've talked to librarians who said, well, we bought video games and it just didn't work, which I sort of don't believe because when I look at the numbers that, of, of libraries that are checking out video games, it's always enormous. Um, but, but having a plan is important. And what I mean by plan is that you can't just buy the games and throw them on the shelf and just expect them to be checked out. And again, this applies to your book collection. This applies to anything we do in the library. We shouldn't exist in a vacuum. So having a, having a plan for how we're going to get these things moving and how we're going to get the community involved is very important. And that's something you can solve on an institutional level. So let's talk about this 
starting small. You don't have to conquer the world in a day. You're not buying every video game for every console that's out right now. Okay, buy a couple that you, you feel the community will, you know, check out. <laughs> um, starting small, 10 to 20 games per system. Um, and what, what I mean by system is, okay, so Krista is one of our hosts today, and she plays World of Warcraft, which is on a PC. And um, what I mean by system is there, there's a thing called a console, which you've heard of a Wii or a PS3 or an Xbox 360. Those are the three current biggest video gaming consoles. So say, okay, we'll get 10 games for each of those three systems, and we'll get some popular titles. That's a, Now you've got a, a 30 to 60 video game collection that will circulate, and, and it's small, but it'll be very popular. And know, know your audience, like we talked about before. Um, open to suggestions should be one of our key, you know, ideas in libraries moving forward. I'm not just talking about um, being open to suggestions for video games, but I mean for anything. As we try to stay relevant in today's, you know, economic times or, or just as, as the informational landscape is changing, being open to suggestions is important. When you're building a new collection, this will be especially important because they'll be helping you to build it. Um, and we'll, right here it says having gaming programs to see what people want. That's just, you know, for books we run book talks, et cetera, things like that. For video games, you don't necessarily run a video game talk, although uh, you really could, I believe. But what you do is you, you run a program where, where people come in and play video games. And when I was a children's librarian before I was in, in academia, I was a children's librarian for five years, and those were some of our most well-attended and, and fun programs, was just getting people together, making new friendships in the library. Um, okay, I was just checking that my audio was still working. And talk to people. This is, you know, all of these things apply to librarianship in general, not just to video games. But again, meet people in your community. Meet 30-something. Meet teenagers. Meet little kids. See what they're playing. See um, my, my friend Andy Woodworth, who uh, is a contributor to my blog. He, is, he runs video game programs for senior citizens. Um, so, you know, just talk to people. Doesn't matter who they are, what their gender, going back to what I said before, doesn't matter their gender or their race or their socioeconomic standing or their age, you got to meet them, talk to them, see what they want. And, and you know, that will, again, especially uh, be helpful to you as you're building a new collection. Um, and having a plan is super important. A lot of libraries that I, I was not so happy with that I've come across, so they don't really have a plan for where they're going as, a, as an organization. They just kind of believe that the library belongs here and they, you know, they're not trying new things. They're not saying, they're not saying, they're asking this question, where do we want to see this collection in a year? And that is one of the key questions that you should be asking yourself for your video game collection. Where do you want to see it go in a year? Do you want to just buy these 60 games and, and say, okay, now I have a video game collection? Do you want to get, continue to buy new uh, game titles? Do you only want to buy certain titles? It's going to be up to you. If, if you have a branch system in your library, you know, are you just buying it for one branch? Are you buying it for multiple branches? So you might have to be pulling in other librarians. Just going back to my last slide, actually, where it says talk to people. I um, don't even feel like it should be your library users. Talk to other librarians. Talk to your staff. See what they're playing. And then there are things that you need to solve on your institutional level, like checkout dates, fines, um, whoops, sorry, um, lost items here. You know, that's been a, a big reason that I've found librarians who I've talked to don't want to get into the, the loaning out video games scene is because they say, well, what if it's lost? 
Um, what I say is that because so many people are gaming now, can we afford to not include this as part of, of what we are as libraries? To say that something that's so important to our community, that so that you know people have been voting with their dollars even in hard economic times to purchase these games and to play these games and to spend their valuable money and time in their life to play them, you know, are we going to let some small issue like oh, you know, losing a couple of video games stop us from from being in that part of people's lives? I really hope that the answer is no to that. But the, I, I understand that there's some situations where you might say no. Um, so going back to where to start, I know $2,500 to $5,000 might sound small for some people, but for a lot of people, it's going to sound really large. Annual budget aimed for $20,000, that sounds like so much money, um, because it is. But there's a couple of things to think about. Again, going back to what I said, you know, we have to stay relevant in libraries. And video games are what people are doing now. I mean, at any given time, there's, there's a couple of movies that are released that are based around video games every year. And I mean, you know, just walk around your local mall and see how important, you know, video game merchandise is to people. Uh, there's no one who you can talk to that doesn't have some type of video game story, including our host Michael, who said, oh, well, I had an Atari. Yeah, everyone has a story like that. They say that you know, even if they're not playing now, they used to play, or they are, you know, they are probably playing now. So just people saying that this is important in my life, maybe your library should now reconsider some of the materials they're currently buying and say maybe we can, you know, fix this video games in. Maybe we'll stop buying a little bit of this and we can buy a little bit of that now. And even if you decide against buying video games, it's still really important for you to, to, to look over that budget and say, is this what's important to our users? See, we're, we're purchasing all of these, you know, reference materials. Are they being used? Or are they being used more than these video games would be used? Or if you say, I don't want video games in my library, at least going through your collection can help you really grow as a librarian and help your library grow in a new place that, that is important to your users. Um, and, and, you know, the big problem right now with developing a collection is we don't have a review source. Um, you know, we have, if for books, you have library journal and school library journal and you have book lists and, you know, Voya or, or any of any number of review sources for books. Video games, it's a lot harder to find. Right now, my website is, I, oops, sorry about that, is, is, is the, uh, a big source of reviews. However, we really don't have a huge number like you would get from a review source. Some places you can go for video game reviews right now are these websites, oneup.com is great. Um, these for Game Informer, Xbox, Nintendo Power, and PlayStation, they're all magazines. And let's say you don't want to start with a video game collection. Let's start by ordering some magazines. Let's get all four of these magazines in your library. See if they circulate. Get two copies each. See if they circulate. And when you see just how, how fast they circulate and, and how often they circulate, it might maybe change your mind a little bit more toward the fact that, you know, this is important for your library. Um, and within the next year, we will hopefully be seeing video game reviews in uh, a couple of the bigger library review sources. Um, I've been behind the scenes with some people, hopefully, you know, to help this along. Um, so this is just a review. Of, of what I said at the beginning, though, about why this video gaming is important. And, you know, media is how humans transmit ideas and information. And, and this is happening through video games. Um, so I can turn off this, and maybe we can chat a little bit with Michael. How do I turn? Okay. Actually, you know, you can, you can actually stay right where you are if you want. Um, okay. In okay. case anybody's got a question, if you want to bring a slide back up. Um, 
or that. I, I We were able to bring up uh, 8, 8bitlibrary.com on this end, so if it didn't come up for you, we'll be able to eventually show everybody. Oh, cool. And, cool. and, and cool. as usual, um, we will be providing with the recording all the slides, all the bookmarks, everything. So if you missed a URL, don't worry about it. We will make that available when we announce the recording later this week. Um, Great. There. Chris, do you have any uh, questions come in from the audience um, at this no, point? No, the only uh, question I'd say is <laughs> one person did just say $20,000, question mark. I think wondering about what would that be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know you started okay. at the beginning saying that really you can even get started with just 500 but to, for the basics, but what would 20000 really entail, what, I think, might be the concern or question. Yeah, what, what, do you, what would you 20, get for twenty grand? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like a lot, you know, uh, it, because it is, <laughs> you know, um, and, and it's difficult. But for twenty thousand, you can probably buy each of the new consoles, which run you a couple hundred apiece, and then you, you can just buy a larger number m number of titles after that. Um, you know, the, the video games are about fifty to sixty dollars a title, um, so you know that's 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 to two to three books, new books. So it is a, a considerably larger expense, but I think in the end you'll see a, um, a much better turnover as far as getting people in your doors. You know, there's only two ways that libraries can quantify success, and you know, our two quantifiable, quantifiable measures of success are circulation numbers and attendance numbers. And uh, Anyone who I've ever talked to who has had a successful video game collection, not only you know is is filling up rooms for programs, you know, standing room only for programs, but they're also circulating uh, video games like crazy. You know, they 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 might have back when Da Vinci Code was popular. You know, ten people on the waiting list for that, and 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 thirty people on the waiting list for video game. So. In libraries that I've seen is successful, it's very successful quantifiably. So that's why I, I would say a large dollar number would pay off in those important numbers to, you know, those of us who we're, you know, justifying that budget to. Yeah, and if that is scary to some people, we've done some presentations here on gaming, um, and where I sometimes purchase my own games. <laughs> um, yeah. There's local stores sometimes in your towns where there's um, discounts. Um, we have a place here in Lincoln called Gamers where people resell their games and you can buy them for cheaper than the original price. So there is a way to, like you said at the beginning, start out small by searching out those kind of places that are out there. Um, yeah, and absolutely. And actually, I, I like that you said that because there, there is other problems, you know, with purchasing games. First of all, a, a lot of libraries are on that you know voucher system or or you know an invoice where you order it first and then you pay the invoice and and mm -hmm. that's Purchase a little bit harder to find yeah. right right but but when when we going back to that slide that I had talked about before when we meet people in our community and we start talking you know that's a connection that would be really valuable to have all you know connections not just with the video game sellers in town but connections with all the businesses in town you know really this talk is video games is just a catalyst for you know uh, successful ideas in libraries and one of those really successful ideas in libraries is building a connection in the community so mm -hmm. if you can make a connection with a, a local business owner who happens to sell video games not only will it, it help you 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 know hopefully save some money but it'll also be a valuable place for the library to get the word out and it'll also be valuable for that business owner to know that people in the community are supporting him as well. You know, it's it's win-win. Yeah. Yep. Gate tonight's game night is sponsored by so and so business in town. Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, I, I'll I'll let Krista chime in again if we get uh, more questions. Uh, yeah, Krista has no problem interrupting me. I know. <laughs> uh, but I I just kind of made some notes and had some questions for you. I'll, I'll try to take them in in somewhat of a logical order here. Um, Go ahead. The, the big one that always comes up is. Okay, you know, even if the whole you know library staff and the director are convinced or whatever, you run into the library board or maybe it is even the director or whatever, where there's just they're just it. You hit that barrier that says games in the library ain't gonna happen. 
can you give us like one or two pieces of advice of how to deal with that sort of, of issue? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, usually their, their argument there is not just about video games, but about video game content. To say, oh, well, video games don't belong in because of the content. So one reason that I would give is, is we have this big thing called Banned Books Week, right, in, in libraries. And, and what it is is about content in the books to say, you know, there's some people in the community that say these books don't belong here. And I think in libraries, what we really should be moving away from is, is censoring content. And then um, along your question, you know, a lot of librarians I've found that have had that argument for me, they say, well, in a book, you don't see this content, but in a video game you do. And of course I always say, well, you know, in a movie you see it and you have that movie there. But also along those lines, what we don't want to do is judge a media based on its content. You should, all media, let me rewind. Just because one book has bad content doesn't mean that we should ban all books. And that, that goes the same with video games. Even if you decide that content in some video games might not fit for your library, that doesn't mean that all video games should not fit in your library. And then as far as uh, if there's still skepticism to say, well, this is very you know, expensive or whatever, I would use those, those ideas, hey, let's start small and let me show you with numbers how successful this is. And it, it, you know, if the content argument doesn't work and the banned books argument doesn't work and they, they don't see these huge numbers, which they will, and, and you know, they're still kind of against it, that's just something, I don't know, how, how else can we all deal with it? I guess that's an ongoing conversation we have to have in libraries. There's also the idea, and this is something that I've kind of kept an eye on, well, I keep an eye on about lots of things gaming related, um, yeah. is colleges and universities having gaming courses and gaming programming. I'm not talking about how to become a game a programmer. Um, I'm talking about using them in their coursework. I just saw an article yesterday about a PC game called Portal that mm -hmm. you might know of, JP, and other people might know. Well, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can't see our screen at the moment, um, but oh, I, I, did, I did bookmark that. A college <laughs> is using this game as, quote, unquote, required reading in one of their courses um, and, and using well, it. Um, in, incoming freshmen, actually. I incoming think. freshmen's required class. Um, to consider it as a classic contemporary work, confront once we mean what we mean to be human and how we understand ourselves, our relationships, our world. They're using it in humanities class and they, it's part of just starting discussion with these students and they have to actually play the game and then come back and talk about it. And it's not just a gaming class, it's a more, it's a general class, this is just one part of it. Um, and there's many of those kind of instances that you can find of colleges and universities using these things to um, uh, complement other courses, history courses, literature courses, economics oh, yeah, courses. Absolutely. I mean, it's out there yeah. and get them learning the, about these games when they're younger and they'll already have that leg up when they get to college and the stuff's in their courses in college. Yep. Yeah, and you know, along those lines, I actually wrote an article about Pokemon for School Library Journal, which was in the May issue, if anyone wants to look it up. And all I did was talk about how we can use Pokemon in the classroom and you know, there's a big uh, there's a big movement in the education system, just what you described, to use video games in in uh, curriculums, not just as a, a source of content, but also a way of assessment. Uh, lots of really cool stuff. If you do, if you are really interested in what Krista said and what what I'm talking about, look up a guy named James Paul G. He oh, yes. speaks at major, yes, and I, I do believe, he, did he come out to one of the old ALA uh, gaming, I, I don't know if we've ever had him out at, at one of the gaming events oh, for know. ALA, but he, he is the man as far as, as talking about video games in education, and that's, that could definitely be another great advocacy tool, Krista, so thanks in, for that. And you know, along those lines, I, I heard that like a hundred years from now, people might look at the original Super Mario Brothers on the same level that they look at like Dostoyevsky's, some of his <laughs> works, because of the level of storytelling and, and, and involvement, you know, because the book is very involving, right? It, it takes a lot out of you, and so does a video game. You're very involved in it, and, and you know, if it tells a good story, then 
we laugh at it now, but you wonder, you wonder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I do, I do, because the name, um, someone did ask about the name, it was, it's James Paul G, and so it's James Paul, and his last name is G-E-E, -E, is how it's spelled. It. And, so and we'll can, add his site to our bookmark. Yeah, we just got it here now, so that's the um, person that we're talking about. Um, do you have a yeah, problem? Yeah, can I actually say one, wait, actually, can I say one more thing about James Paul G? Yeah, sure. He, he uh, had a look, yeah, he had a little thing on PBS. And what he talked about was how the educational landscape is changing. Um, and, and what he means by that is, in the past, to learn something, you had to go to school. That's how you learn something. Now, in the digital age, when you, you can learn things in other places, school becomes less important. And what, what he called these other places was sort of competition for schools, and one of the, those that he listed is libraries because what libraries do really well is get you information on demand, the information that you need when you need it. And, and so as, as educational landscape changes, libraries are possibly going to be uh, play a more important role you know than they used to. Which is something that I learned from from James Paul G. He's not a librarian, so that's very cool of him. <laughs> yeah. um, I do have a comment on our um questions here. Uh, this person says, uh, more than of a comment than a question, but Steam offers, Steam is an online place where you can download yeah. games and whatnot, which port, what Portal is from, that's where I have it from, offers the Source U program, S-O-U-R-C-E-U, capital U, where you can get access to 15 plus Steam games with private forms for very reasonable prices. And this person says they had planned on holding um, LAN tournaments as well as teaching a few Source um, SDK classes, just an idea people may want to check out. Steam is a great site to get um, PC, to get games, and sometimes they have really good prices, too, to download these. <laughs> but that's a great idea yeah, that they have um, access to some um, private forums. So you could have something set up for the um, kids coming into your library where they can all use that area to um, safely and privately communicate about the games they're playing. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, going along that communication line, you know what you just said. What's really important that a library can really get out of, of bringing video games into their library is just what you said. Having people communicating information to each other. You're you're helping to build connections in your community, and these connections are built around information. It's going to be built around these kids or these adults or whoever they are sharing information with each other. You know, so what if it's if it's video games? Who cares what the information is? What's really important is that your library is now sort of this this hub of, of information and communication. So that's really cool. I love that Steam idea. But I mean, I think that would happen no matter what what game we have in there. It's very cool, though. Sure. Um, you 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 touched on the the um, issue of content in video games, and I want to kind of come back to that for for a second. And, and it's been in my experience in most public libraries that they, they won't go near any sort of video game labeled anything above teen uh, in the yeah. ratings. Uh, so, so no, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto or Halo or anything like that. Um, and, and in conjunction with that, I tend to notice that video game collections are shelved in the teen area. Um, and this yeah. is something I've, yeah. I've noticed a lot with graphic novels also. And, you know, I'm an adult. I read graphic novels. I don't play as many video games, but, you know, I wouldn't necessarily stumble over them because I don't go to the teen area. Yeah, that's a, that, I mean, that's a, that's a problem, I guess. It, it's just a cliche thing that we have. I mean, the average video game buyer is, is older than I am. And uh, and so, you know, people of all ages are playing these games. It's just, you know, we can get over that together, I think. It's a stereotype I think we can get over together because along the lines, there was just that article last week in the New York Times that, or maybe it was two weeks ago, um, about how uh, the majority of people reading, you know, YA literature are not YA aged. So I wonder if this is not just a conversation we're having about video games, but we're having it about, you know, all kind of you know, what stereotypically teen media, you know. Yeah, um, but I, I would love to see these video games shelved all over the place. Mm -hmm. Or not with the teens, but it's fine. <laughs> sure. <laughs> start somewhere. Right. There, I've seen um, many libraries doing programs now, adult gaming nights, meaning just for the adults to come in to play the game. Because they, they know that the, the average gamer, the age of the average gamer, what, is now 35, 36, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. 
um, that's, you know, the studies, that's what they, that's what it's out there. So um, they say, why should we just have these for the teens? And there shouldn't just be in the teen section, they just say, here's the video game section, no matter who you are. Right. <laughs> um, I agree. I, you know, part of it, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. All you. Okay. Well, I, I think part of the problem, too, is that, um, well, I wouldn't call this a problem, but I think teen librarian is a new mm -hmm. sort of idea in libraries. I mean, it is a new idea in libraries. This is like the new positions that have been created over the last 10 years. And so I think part of the reason maybe that the, that the teen librarian or the teens are kind of getting this is just because they're looked at maybe as kind of this, this fresh new librarian with the fresh ideas. But you know what? I, in my opinion, all librarians are really terrific, and, and any of us can be doing this. And I, I just think it might just be because maybe the administration thinks of them as the new kind of fresh idea, but we can all be doing this. We can all be doing this. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and and the, the other thing, I, the, the last kind of note I made to myself when we were talking about money, and, and this is where I just encourage more money be spent, is, uh, and I'm sure JP will agree with me, is, you know, get the games, but then get the books that go with the games, mm -hmm. you know, that explain oh, how to play it and the cheat codes and all that other stuff, you know, kind of do a one-to-one -one where if you're going to get the, the, the game, get the book that goes with it, the strategy, strategy guide. guide, that's the word I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let me explain that a little bit. So uh, video games come out, right, and, and a lot of times what will be published right alongside that video game is a pretty lengthy book that describes you know, how to get through this game or secrets or whatever. You could almost think of that as a critique if you think of critiques of literature. And um, uh, there's a couple reasons why it's a great idea to buy those. First of all, what it just proves to you or, or could prove to someone skeptical is that an information community exists around this game and that if a whole book can be published just about one game and a whole book could be published about every game, then that means that there are, you know, there is a lot of value outside of just the game and, and that would be that information community. But then second, is that now you've got, uh, you know, going back to what we said about quantifiable success, now you can be checking out a book and a, and a video game. So now you've got two numbers there that you wouldn't have had in the past. And so, it, you know, if we're talking about quantifying, you know, success, that's a great way to do it. And, and along those lines, not only strategy guides, but one thing that I'm big on advocating for is connecting collections. And what I mean by that is, um, you can have someone loan out a, a, a video game about World War II, and then you can loan out the strategy guide about it, and then you can loan out some nonfiction about that, that you know, time period, or you can loan out some fiction, or you can loan out similar games, or, you, you know, you can loan out similar topics. So now instead of just loaning one book of one video game, now we've loaned out not just the video game, but the book, you know, strategizes the video game and, and some nonfiction books that are related. And so now we're not just becoming an entertainment center, but we're adding value to our users' lives and, and, and in the end also, you know, being, looking pretty successful doing it. <laughs> yeah, and that made me think that, you know, chances are, especially in a public library in your genre fiction section, there's probably some novels already that you own that are based on video games. I mean, there are World of Warcraft novels, there are mm -hmm. Gears of War novels, there's, you know, you, you name it, there are more and more, more and more fiction being written based around video games also. Yeah, and, and I mean, if you can get them reading some of those, then you can move them on to other sci-fi, mm -hmm. and then you can move them on to other fiction, and now what you've just done is you've just done reader's advisory, you know? It just so happens that not all of them were books. Yep. And there are games that were based on novels going the other direction. Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yes, it was a huge movie series. It was a series of books first. Some of our teenagers may not oh. know that. And <laughs> it's now an I'm online not... game, Lord of the Rings Online. <laughs> so you can say, you know yeah, that game? Absolutely. You know it's a book? Go read it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, uh, I mean, if anyone watched the Super Bowl this year, the, one of the biggest commercials was for Dante's Inferno, which was a book mm -hmm. based off a pretty popular nice. work of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> a, a video game, I should say. A video yeah. game based off a book. I'm sorry for that flub. Yep, yep. But uh, it, and that actually was a, a pretty good game from what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. Well, thanks, guys. This was great. Yeah.
JP, thank you very much. Is is there anything else you want to kind of throw in, and and we're gonna kind of wrap up this section and, and switch yeah, gears? Yeah, you know, they told I, I've been told to stop plugging my website, so I'm not. But at this no, point, go for it. Go to agentlibrary.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, yeah. One more thing I wouldn't mind adding in too is just we're like running this retro game festival on September 11th in New Jersey. So if you if you're around Jersey at the time, come out. But I also think what what's cool about that for any any librarian just to hear is that I'm not just talking about these current video games, but almost preserving our heritage. And, and preserving heritage is one of those big things libraries do. And you know, gaming is is an important part of some people's lives. Like Michael talking about his Atari 2600. Now you know we're going to be playing an Atari 2600 at the library in a couple of weeks. So you know that's another that's another thing that we can also think about is is you know how can we preserve gaming heritage as well. Yeah, and, and I Absolutely. think at, at our 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 uh, state conference uh, this year, Chris and I are running the gaming night, and if everything goes well, the Atari mm -hmm. will be running. Um, <laughs> trouble is, they're yeah, not designed they're not that. designed to be hooked up to today's projectors. So that's <laughs> Ooh, <we need laughs> that's the fun to... part. That's yeah. true. That's true. You're right. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> Something to check out. Yeah. We, we ran into it. that last year, and we need to tr we need to figure that out before our conference in November. And I'm just going to throw I in looking looking at your banner there that, that one of you guys or both of you are behind the whole uh, uh, get a tattoo at ALA. Oh yeah. Show that you're was a them. librarian. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, that was our thing. We, uh, that, it started as a joke on Twitter, and it kind of blew up. And at the last ALA, we uh, had a bunch of librarians go as a group to get tattoos, That's like all awesome. like books and, and the reader thing, and, and it was cute. Yeah, yeah I seem to know that people with having the, the that ALA logo now as a tattoo and yeah. other things. That's that's an awesome idea. Do we have one more question coming? Yeah. Um, we just have a comment actually. Somebody um, uh, contributing. Uh, Tiffany Keenan, who's a, libra a librarian from here in Nebraska, Alliance Public Library. Um, there are more and more video games being written by popular authors as well, like Tom Clancy and Clive Barker. Mm -hmm. So if you oh, know people that like these, these yep. certain writers already, you can turn them on to the games that they are involved with. Yep, definitely. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, you know, actually going back to your question way in the past about how do we convince a you know a skeptical library board or, or director or even a skeptical community a video game with the word Tom Clancy in the title I mean how can that not fit in a library yeah, yeah. so and for any Tom Clancy fans I just found out he's got a new book coming out in December <laughs> it's been hey, several okay. years I'm waiting <laughs> I impatiently so anyways well JP I want to thank you once again that that was a wonderful presentation great conversation um, and I, we appreciate you taking uh, some time out of your day uh, to do this for us. Yeah, very useful. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so oh, much. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a uh, presentation back from you. You're welcome to hang out for the rest of the show. Uh, that, that's you know not a problem. We encourage it, but if you do need to go, uh, totally understand. And Great. We'll Thanks, guys. Yep, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, JP. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye. All right, peace. All right. Um, so we, uh, as was mentioned, we pulled up some of the uh, sites that were talked about that are currently in the bookmark list for this section. Uh, this session, we will be adding these. Um, Steam is uh, at steampowered.com. It's a great way to um, buy video games with without going to a store and purchasing a physical object. Mm -hmm. um, allows you to. I, I I use Steam for a couple of games because. Um, once I purchased it through Steam, I can go to any other computer I own and get that game, and and it it carries through all of the different computers that I run in. Portal is one of those few games that that I really do like to play. I also got Plants vs Zombies recently, oh, God, and yeah, I, I kind of got game. sucked into that. I haven't done it um, yet, but I need to. Oh <laughs> yeah, it's a fun game. Um, James Paul G. There is, in case you didn't catch how to spell his name, this is his website, uh, JamesPaulG.com. Uh, we will bookmark that, and you can take a look at that. There is the Legend of Zelda and Philosophy. There you go. How's, how's that yeah. for a little retro there? Um, and 8-Bit Library, as you saw uh, earlier, uh, was able to come up. I think, it was just, it, I think the site was running a little a slow. A little bit, but now it's, it's uh, It fine. seems to be working again uh, well. So, you know, we had so many people going to his site all at once, I think. Yes, it's, it's, it's just is, way too It's our fault. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll take credit for that one. Okay, so... Um, 
so we're, we got about 15 more minutes left in our hour here. Uh, and I've got a, a relatively short list of bookmarks this month. Uh, I wanted to be sure to have uh, plenty of opportunity for uh, JP to give his talk. And, and the first one I will bring up, this one I did actually bookmark this morning, um, the, the Portal game, uh, Wabash that. College. It is their reading. It's, it's on their required reading list. So, so a video game is being described as required reading in this case, and I, I find that very, very interesting. And it's a game that makes you think. I'm, oh, I, yeah. I am not going to try to explain it. If you, you look it up, uh, take a look at it, and it's, just keep in mind that the cake is a lie. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's not just a game where you're trying to do something. It, it messes with your mind. And perception, and yeah, you really have to think about things. And this one also, what's great, it, people, you hear people talking about it and the cake is a lie thing and stuff about how what's really going on in this game, but there's also science in this, physics, mm -hmm. how you're supposed to yes. negotiate through this game. It takes a lot of that kind of thinking too. It's not just a shoot. There's no shoot 'em up or anything in it actually. Yeah. Well, they're shooting, but you shoot portals right, into yeah. a wall. It's, it's, yeah. It's, but not yeah. like, but it's very, yeah. <laughs> it will either be, it, it, it's a kind of a three dimensional puzzler yes. too. And yes. so it will either frustrate you instantly or, or you'll love every minute of it. And I'm kind of stuck in the middle there. <laughs> Okay, so let me talk about some of the uh, other bookmarks I found recently. Uh, some of these get back to some things that have uh, been asked of me lately, maybe some previous sessions, things like that. And um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to remind everybody, uh, I mentioned this last month, I will be mentioning it again next month, I'm sure. Every month. Every, every month again. until uh, conference, Library Camp Nebraska 3. Um, you don't have to live in Nebraska to attend, but, uh, you know, chances are you do live in Nebraska if you're going to attend. It is one of the pre-conferences or state conference this year. It will be on Wednesday, October 13th in Grand Island. You do not need to pay to attend library free. camp. It is free. And in fact, you can come just to library camp and not come to the rest of the conference if you really want to. But we'd love you to come to the whole conference. Please, too. yes. <laughs> it's not required. But no. um, registration is being handled, excuse me, through uh, NLA. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the instructions are on this website and also on the NLA conference website. So something to look forward to. We invite everybody to attend that. Um, online converters. Some people have been asking me lately about uh, mm. services to convert different file formats from one to the other. Um, I've got a WAV file I wanted as an MP3. I've got a PDF and I want it as a Word document. I've got um, an EPUB or, any, or a PDF and I want it to be an EPUB ebook format, things like that. There are a lot of them out there. This one I just stumbled over earlier this month, and the really cool bit about this is it's got all these formats built into this one interface. I've got bookmarks for image converters. I've got bookmarks for PDF converters. I've got bookmarks for these other converters. This is one place you say, you know what, uh, I've got a document, and I want, it, I want to turn it into a doc format. You choose that. You upload your file, or you uh, enter the URL of it if it's online. You click convert file, and um, depending on whether, you know, videos will take longer than documents, that sort of mm -hmm. thing, but it will do the conversion for you, and you can download the converted file. So this is kind of your handy-dandy tool of the month, I would think, um, if you've got anything. And you can go through and see all the different formats, uh, but literally dozens of uh, conversion options available to you. Um, Oh, we have a comment. Quick comment, um, question, yes. The uh, website, this is um, David Bibb from the University of Great Falls Library, says that uh, zamzar.com, yep. Z-A-M-Z-A-R.com, we'll add that to our links, also have a number of formats for audio, video, documents, etc. Yep. Yeah, I'm familiar with Zamzar. That's one I've used in the past. Um, I, I don't know if any one of these is any better than any other. I mean, it, it, it usually either works or it fails. <laughs> I, that, that's mm -hmm. uh, that. Uh, Zamzar seems to be taking its time loading up, so we'll let that just kind of run in the background. But yes, we will add that to the bookmarks list. Um, the next two, I'll throw these up here, KidsTube and TeacherTube. I'll actually just load TeacherTube. Um, these are alternatives to YouTube. But they are, and especially TeacherTube, it's stuff that's already been looked at by per, uh, adults <laughs> and have said, yes, these uh, videos are all appropriate for use in education. Uh, they were really created specifically because a lot of schools block YouTube because there's all sorts of inappropriate content on YouTube. Yeah. But there's some really good content on YouTube. Yes. 
So what the folks at TeacherTube and KidVid have done is they go through YouTube and they find the stuff that's really good for educational purposes and they make this available and then they get the school gets the IT department to say, well, okay, you're blocking YouTube, but please unblock TeacherTube. And we know that anything on here the kids can watch and it's not going to be a problem. So um, even in public libraries, if you want, if kids are looking for a video of something, you might want to direct them mm -hmm. towards TeacherTube or KidVid. Um, so they don't maybe stumble over the things that, that might get the parents upset uh, <laughs> about what are you showing my child in the mm -hmm. library. It's like so, came up. Oh, Zed did come up. There we go. And there we go. Also, Ooh, yep. So, uh, oh, this upload. Is one I've used before. Yeah. You sent me this one time when I was trying okay. to do something. I recognize um, it. Yeah. And so you can see there's image formats, doc formats. In fact, they might even have more formats than the other one. So <laughs> there you go. And uh, that's an ad. An ad break. There we go. Okay, Sorry about that. that. <laughs> Points for Zamzar for playing us a video ad. All right. Um, and then just a few more. I, I kind of pulled some things uh, this morning. I tend to go through and say, hey, what have I been looking at? Um, this one's just an announcement. This is not available to anybody or to everybody yet. Um, so you may have this and not even know it. But Google is testing, and there's a video you can watch that explains it in more detail, testing um, search results as you type. So literally, okay. as you are typing in the search box, the search results just to what you're typing. Okay. So <laughs> if you type, you know, um, a, a and B, it gives you A and B, but the moment you say and C, the results will change as you are typing. So you don't have to say, oh, well, I should have limited by another word. Hmm. I'll not type another word and search again. So in other words, it's searching as you type, not after you click search. Interesting. Yeah, um, so I'm just like, ooh, give me access to that. I want to play with it. And it turns out it's a testing on a select number of users at the moment. So it's not something you can turn on, but you might want to keep an eye out for it. Sometimes they'll announce these things in, like, Google Labs yeah. and the experimental features. So I can see that that cool. would be very interesting to see how, just see dynamically how as you, when you're, Teaching, like in, in universities and colleges, teaching the first year students, here's how you run a search, here's how you do, you know, we don't use the word bullying anymore, and see how the search results change dynamically right as you're adding uh -huh. other terms to it. And you can see, oh, that's what you mean by adding that or deleting that, not using that term, because you yep. can see it change live. Hey, in library school, I was taught you write out all your searches in advance, yeah. and you plan. <laughs> and then you do these two searches, and then you combine the previous searches. And, oh. and none of the freshmen coming in who aren't library school students do that. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, they type in one term and take us. what comes up. Yeah. Well, and that reminds me of a quote that um, um, uh, uh, librarians search, patrons find. Uh-huh. You know, search is a very specific thing in, in, the, in a lot of people's minds. So, okay. Um, I'm going to mention Firefox. We're using Firefox here in the recording, as you can see. Um, the latest betas of version 4.0 are now out. I think we're on the fourth beta. You can uh, go to the Mozilla.com site, find the beta version. It's got some interesting new features in it. Um, I've played with it just a little bit. I've got to admit, I've mostly moved to Chrome. I don't use Firefox as much as I used to. Um, but they are starting to integrate some features. Um, crash protection on tabs, uh, some of the stuff Chrome has had for a little while. Um, but especially if you're a web designer, you might want to check this out and, and test your websites um, against the next version coming out. But it's, it's going to be nice. I, I, I think uh, what little I have seen of it so far, I, I've been impressed with. A um, couple more here. Uh, this one is for a website, uh, Super Site for Windows by Paul Thurot. Um, this is something I've noticed is a problem for me at home. Um, and this might, I think, be useful to some of the uh, folks who run the public PCs, um, possibly, especially for the staff. If you have automatic updating turned on, um, which maybe in a staff or, or public PC situation, you probably have turned off. I hope so. Um, but at home, you probably have it turned on. And, and for some of us more techie people, I can remotely log into my computer at home. Uh, as long as it's booted up and I'm logged in. Well, the problem is, is that I go away for a couple of days, and then updates run, and then the computer reboots itself. Now, the problem is I'm no longer logged in, so I can no longer remotely access my computer. <laughs> oh, that sucks. Yeah, it kind of does, <laughs> especially when I'm gone for like a week, and this happens on day two. Um, so there is actually something you can do in the Windows registry to turn off the automatic rebooting. 
So updates will run and updates will install, but then you have to reboot. This may not be of use to everybody. I thought it was just a neat little trick. Uh, I've used it. I've not had the opportunity to actually need to use it yet, um, but actually I think uh, some updates are coming soon, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll check that out the next, next time around. So just kind of a, a, a little tip out there for those of you who might need it. Um, and uh, I will uh, talk about this one here. Um, I write. Um, I, uh, I, I, I have a book project I'm working on right now, and sometimes I have to kind of force myself to get some writing done. So this is a, a web-based or download application called Write or Die. Okay. And it will you give it a either a word count and or a time limit, and it will basically prevent you from doing anything else on your computer until you have reached that time limit and or word count. <laughs> Um, and there are some very interesting features, especially in the desktop edition. Um, you can make it so that um, you, the backspace uh, doesn't work during that time. Um, you can make it so that you can't save anything until you've met your goal. So in other words, you better write. Um, you can um, make it so that the, the program is always in front. In other words, it becomes your word processor. So you can't switch to another program, you can't uh, do anything else. And so um, just fun. So you can say, you know what, I need to write a thousand words in the next 45 minutes. You click write, and then until you've written those thousand words and or you've reached your 45 minutes, you can't do anything else with your computer. Okay. Craig, <laughs> Chris is I like, know. no, I don't think I want that. <laughs> Luckily, I don't write stuff like that anymore. I don't have to. Like, it's for the people with deadlines. For, yeah, people with deadlines who want mm -hmm. school. Um, I know I was the world's greatest procrastinator in college. Yep. Yeah, this would have been probably very useful to me then. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and the last thing I'm going to show, I, I kind of de debated this, uh, but I, I think I'm going to do it. Um, some of you, this is for the Nebraska folks. Some of you may have heard of a project we've been working on here in Nebraska called Nebraska Libraries on the Web. Um, this is free WordPress-based hosted websites for, right now, public libraries. Uh, we have done three test groups so far. We are working uh, right now to put together uh, the next testing group for training this fall. Um, right now it is invite only, um, but if you are interested in kind of how it works, there is a want to participate link in the upper right hand corner here. Um, our current plan is, is that to, that's new as of yesterday. I thought that, yes. so I've looked, I didn't know that we have, sorry, yeah, that, I didn't remember uh -huh. that from the last time I looked at this. Okay. Um, and like I said, right now invite only, but the plan is early in 2011, we will actually kind of open this up to public libraries statewide, then see how it goes and possibly open it up to other libraries beyond that. And, you know, still some decisions to be made, some kinks to work out of the system, that sort of thing. But I, I just kind of wanted to be out there, you know, we're getting those phone calls, we're getting those emails, when are you going to let, you know, when, when can I get in, when can I use this? We're working on it, the project is going really, really well. Yeah. We just want to do a couple of more things with a couple more test groups to, to kind of get all the details down, the kinks worked out of the system uh, before we open it up to everybody. But you can keep an eye on what's going on with the project here. Uh, Superior Public Library just went live last week, last Thursday. Um, I've got a couple more who, fingers crossed, will go live this week. They're kind of, uh, they're, they're thinking they're really close to being ready. So uh, things are going quite well, I would say there. Yeah, this is a really great project to see all these libraries, these some very small public libraries who are finally having a web presence. Yes. Or they had one before and it was buried somewhere in the city's site. Um, they have their own, they have a blog, they're posting things. It's really great to see these mm -hmm. guys, these people yep. being I'll, out there. I'll, I'll, I'll even uh, bring up Superior here just for fun because, you know, um, so uh, they're pulling it up. She said she really liked this image because it pretty much describes Superior. You know, there, there's nothing <laughs> out there. Uh, um, there's, there's some things out there. But <laughs> the town's out there. The town is there, yes, yeah. uh, I guess, but uh, the, the larger area, mm -hmm. uh, not much else, so. Lots of open spaces. Yes, open great. space. That's yes. wonderful. So, all right. Um, do we have any other questions or comments? Yeah, anybody have, have any through? questions or comments? Type them in the questions. If you want us to unmute you, we can. I see you guys have been just tossing them in here along, which is perfect. So yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. But we are pretty much um, out of time. Yeah, we're around. It's, it's about our hour. Um, yeah. Nothing. Um, okay, and I'll just throw in. You know, um, I. 
actually, I think I have the next couple of months of my interviewees scheduled already. Uh, I think Chris will talk about what's coming up. But mm -hmm. always, you can email me and um, suggestions, questions. Um, if you've got an idea for uh, something to specifically talk about like we do with JP, I'm happy to discuss that with you. Um, I know uh, a couple of folks this last month sent me some things saying, hey, you should talk about X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And I remember one specific case that was kind of time sensitive, so I didn't talk about it this month. I think I've got it in next month. Um, so, you know, always looking for suggestions and ideas. And uh, even if you want to be the interviewee, uh, yes. please, uh, we'll, we're happy to do that. You're doing something great and wonderful at your library that you want to share with the rest of your colleagues. Get in touch with us. We'll put you on. Yep. <laughs> and it does not have to be something technology related. Michael's t monthly tech talks are geared that direction. Mm -hmm. But um, anything you're doing, we can put you into an Encompass Live. <laughs> yes. Um, not a problem. Um, for example, related to gaming, I don't know if you can go to the Encompass Live homepage. Uh, just Google Encompass. Yes. Um, it's not until October, but I'll just plug it right now. Um, Hastings College, um, Perkins Library here in Nebraska, um, on October 20th, Susan Franklin will be doing a session about their gaming nights they do at the University Library. So if you're interested in gaming from today, sign up and join us for that one. Mm -hmm. um, next week will be a session on um, Heritage Quest, which is a database that we have through our Nebraska Access System of databases, where we have databases for Nebraska libraries. So if you're in Nebraska Library, that would be definitely something you'd want to take a look at. Susan Nisley, our one of our librarians here will be showing that. And then this is just a list of any of our um, upcoming sessions that yep. you can... Um... And it looks like next month I'll be talking about ebooks. That's what you told me. Yep. <laughs> so I put it on there. <laughs> I have enough trouble keeping track of what I'm doing on Friday. <laughs> so, uh, you know, next month that's good too. So. Okay. Uh, so okay. it looks like... Let me just check here. No new questions or anything? I think we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you very much for attending um, Encompass Live this week and our Tech Talk. Hope you learned a lot. And we will see you next time. Great, thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.